Welcome to ESOL Studio, your weekly hepatology broadcast news. In today's episode, we will talk about the new nomenclature for steatotic liver disease. And we will be joined by Professor Roberto Vettor, who is an endocrinologist, professor of internal medicine from Padova, Italy. Professor Giulio Marchesini, who is a professor of internal medicine and diabetology from Bologna, Italy. They were both involved in writing the ESOL clinical practice guidelines for NAFLD back in 2016. And we'll also uh, be joined, uh, it's our pleasure also to host uh, uh, Professor Nancy Rowe from uh, Rush University in Chicago, uh, who has a very large experience in dealing with uh, patients with end-stage liver disease and liver transplantation. So our task today is to talk about this new nomenclature of fatty liver disease, of steatotic liver disease, which has been put in place uh, after a very long process uh, that involved uh, many experts around the world and the two main scientific societies, which are uh, ESL, ASLD, and also uh, the Latin America Society of Hepatology. And um, there, there are two main issues that I would like to discuss with you today. One relating to the way this disease is now defined, which is uh, based on the presence of a phenotype composed of a set, a list of metabolic risk factors, which are supposed to be indicative of, meta of metabolic dysfunction. And the second point I would like to discuss is how this new nomenclature accommodates people who have the typical metabolic profile of steatotic liver disease, but also drink amount of alcohol, uh, daily alcohol that, that are above the thresholds that we used to have for defining uh, the condition previously labeled non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and how the interaction between the two uh, is important in clinical practice and should be reflected upon in the nomenclature. So let's first start with the definition per se. And just to set up um, the, the framework, I would like to remind people that the whole idea behind that was to have a positive definition of the disease, not an exclusionary diagnosis. So, Julio, you were among the very first ones who have described the fact that what we then called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease was, in fact, the hepatic manifestation of the metabolic syndrome. That was in the title of one of your seminal papers, I think, in, back in 1999 in diabetes. Yeah. So based on that and all the knowledge that has been accumulated since, the idea is, first of all, to identify steatosis. That's the, that's the starting point. You need to make a diagnosis of steatosis. And, and that's only once you have a diagnosis of steatosis, the guidance starts to apply. So what we will be discussing today, and I say that in order to avoid any confusion, is not a surrogate for steatosis, and it's not a, a, um, a set of criteria that will identify people at risk of progression. It's a set of criteria that simply helps us uh, in the process of saying the steatosis we're seeing is due to metabolic dysfunction and therefore this is muscle D, rather than due to some other weird, rare genetic or toxic or drug-induced causes. So that's what we're discussing. You have to make the diagnosis of steatosis first. Now, once you have done that, and if I can have the first slide, that will help us with the discussion. So I hope we can see the first slide. Once you have done that, uh, we have identified a list of criteria, uh, and I would like you to comment a little bit on whether you think that this list is justified, whether these criteria, which are based on BMI, waist circumference, glycemic regulation, lipid profile, whether these criteria are specific enough uh, and sensitive enough uh, to diagnose metabolic dysfunction and insulin resistance. And I would also like to ask you if you agree with the fact that only one of these criteria is sufficient uh, to diagnose the disease. So maybe let's start with Julio, since you were the first one who introduced this, this concept. Yes, thank you, Vlad, uh, for the introduction. Um, as far as I know, the five components are not equal, equally uh, dictating uh, the possibility to uh, uh, make uh, uh, fat accumulate in the liver. Uh, for sure, the presence of uh, uh, obesity, 
is deeply connected with uh, the accumulation of fat in the liver as well. And uh, also the presence of diabetes or impaired glucose tolerance, uh, which now can also be defined by the simple measurement of uh, glycated hemoglobin is something which uh, um, facilitates the accumulation of uh, uh, fat in the liver. And uh, the, the same is true for triglycerides and possibly also for the decrease of HDL cholesterol, which is deeply linked uh, with uh, all the metabolic disorders and uh, with the in insulin resistance. I have some doubt that uh, blood pressure probably is not as effective in the uh, pathogenesis or in the possibility of uh, fat uh, entering the liver and accumulating in the liver. But uh, the, the reasons for maintaining blood pressure is probably that blood pressure per se is a great risk of future um, cardiovascular events. So uh, it's uh, something which uh, should be considered, considering that a cardiovascular outcome is probably the most common outcome in a, a patient with a, a liver disease. With a, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, possibly uh, uh, limiting the presence uh, to only one of these five components uh, has enlarged the, uh, the spectrum of a subject which may be classified as a uh, um, subject with metabolic dysfunction associated liver disease, but nonetheless, we still have some, uh, uh, some patients which are uh, cryptogenic. And so uh, this was a, a tentative uh, uh, or an, an attempt, let us say, to facilitate or to clarify something in terms of uh, diagnosis and uh, also facilitate the um, definition of a, a large part of patients. And so, uh, yes, to... I think it's uh, it's worth. It's worth, uh, they are all linked more or less with insulin resistance, which is probably the uh, common soil of all these uh, changes. Now, two quick questions, Julio, before I, I asked Roberto uh, about the body weight. Uh, do you think 5.7% for HbA1c is too strict? And do you think we should have, shouldn't have dropped HOMA? Should have? Do you think we should have kept HOMA in the definition? No, no, HOMA, uh, I, I think it's, uh, HOMA should not enter the definition. It's uh, quite difficult, it, it is not measured uh, uh, commonly. And uh, so why HOMA and not OGIS? I could say that is oral glucose insulin sensitivity. This would make uh, the definition more and more complicated and uh, more and more difficult uh, for uh, the, the general practitioner. Since I do believe that this classification should be uh, definitely extended to all the general practitioner, if you re if we really wish to enlarge the recruitment and the the awareness uh, on this. Uh, uh, disease and so uh, OMA is not uh, relevant at all. Uh, the think... restriction of uh, HbA1c goes uh, uh, part in line with uh, the uh, tentative to define very subtle changes in glucose, which might be important uh, in, uh, in the pathogenesis of uh, fat in the liver. So Roberto, what do you think about the, uh, the the BMI measurement, the waist circumference? Is it something that people do? I was surprised to find out that most endocrinologists and especially those working in obesity do not measure actually waist circumference. It's, it's not, not that trivial to measure. So what do you think about that, the, introducing those in, among the criteria? And do you think we should really be very careful about the ethnic um, thresholds? Uh, yes, uh, I think that uh, to measure uh, waist, uh, waist circumference is uh, really very easy, but uh, it's not so easy and uh, not so frequent to see the register, to register this, uh, this data in, uh, 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 
of the patient uh, you visit and so on in the, in the surgeries. I think that uh, to go back to the, the, the criteria, I think that if you adopt the criteria of the metabolic syndrome, we have to, uh, we need to have always uh, and uh, uh, the presence of the visceral obesity and after the presence of visceral obesity, you have to consider the other, uh, the other uh, aspects of the fasting glucose, uh, the blood pressure, and so on, as in the definition of metabolic syndrome. Because visceral obesity and the dysfunction of the uh, adipose tissue is the main trigger inducing, uh, uh, is one of the main triggers, and uh, in, my, in my mind is the, the most important trigger in, uh, in inducing uh, the uh, muffled uh, D or Nash or state hepatitis uh, uh, development. So we have to consider first the uh, the uh, the adipose tissue, the dysfunction of adipose tissue, and uh, to uh, and uh, and uh, to have the measure of a visceral adiposity is one a surrogate of uh, uh, of the dysfunction of uh, adipose tissue. And uh, this is mandatory because if you consider the expansion of the, of the post tissue, there are many aspects uh, which are mimicking uh, what, what is happening also at the, le at the level of the liver. For sure, you have uh, a decrease in insulin sensitivity and you have uh, the decrease in insulin sensitivity at the level of the liver. You have uh, the lipotoxicity because of the, uh, uh, the, the alteration in insulin sensitivity of uh, of uh, of the adipose tissue and the leakage of the lipid substrates outside the uh, adipose tissue reaching uh, the periphery and in, the, in this case uh, reaching the liver. You have uh, mitochondrial damages at the level of, uh, of adipose tissue and you have uh, the mitochondrial dysfunction also at the level of the liver. You have inflammation and the macrophage infiltration at the level of adipose tissue and you have infiltration, uh, infiltration or activation of uh, the inflammation at the level of the liver. You have stem cell abnormality at the level of the of the adipose tissue and stem cell abnormalities at the level of the liver, and uh, also many other uh, uh, changes uh, and uh, uh, right. which. Uh, well, practically uh, speaking, practically speaking, I know pathophysiology is very complex. We have to measure. We have to measure, uh, uh, measure. The, uh, measure. Uh, the, the the waist uh, circumference because this is the definition of the uh, right. metabolic syndrome. And before you have to define the metabolic syndrome as it was defined, is defined, you, it's mandatory to have a waist tip, a waist uh, circumference, and after that, uh, at least one of the other uh, uh, criteria. So you are telling me that you would have chosen first a waist circumference criterion and second, uh, an additional criteria from the list. Correct, correct, because it's mandatory, in my opinion, to have the visceral obesity and after that, another, as uh, Ju uh, Julio presented the report uh, before uh, and, uh, and uh, told before, uh, for example, if you consider just the blood pressure, okay, if you have a, a people, uh, a patient just with an elevated blood pressure is not enough. To have a, 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 I mean, a, the, the, to be sure that there are something at the level of the liver, uh, uh, and uh, and in particular to have the, the some steatotic changes at the level of the liver. If you have just uh, the hypertension, so you have you you need to have the visceral deposit plus the hypertension, and probably this in additive uh, 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 risk factor in order to the development of the cardiovascular complication of the metabolic liver disease. Okay. Um, but again, uh, it is interesting that if you read the paper that will soon come out, nobody ever says, makes any allusion to the metabolic syndrome. But instead, they're talking about metabolic risk factors. So I think that we should not think in terms of metabolic syndrome. And we should not think in terms of these factors determining prognosis, because these are only factors that determine a diagnosis. It is a little bit like hepatitis C. If you have a viral load, it will not tell you the prognosis. It simply tells you the disease is there. You need to look for additional factors for prognosis. So this is one very important thing. The other very important thing, as I said in the beginning, is that you have to start with steatosis, which means that you only interpret blood pressure in a patient who has steatosis. And therefore the question becomes, is it possible that you have steatosis and increased blood pressure, and yet the steatosis is not due 
uh, to metabolic dysfunction. You might find an example, one in, in 10,000, but most of the time, don't you agree that in someone who has fat in the liver, being diagnosed with hypertension uh, tells you that he has metabolic uh, liver, liver disease, theatotic liver disease. Short, short answer. Julio. Yeah, Julio. Uh, this is a very difficult question. As I said before, and uh, I agree totally with you, um, we must start with the presence of fat in the liver. And if fat is in the liver and if blood pressure is above a certain threshold, we might assume that something is going wrong with metabolic involvement, let us yeah. say. But nonetheless, I, um, I do believe that uh, this uh, um, is not uh, always uh, the, the case. And uh, we might have uh, uh, blood pressure per se and not uh, deeply linked or, uh, or at least not uh, deeply linked to a metabolic factor which is uh, in itself uh, responsible for fat in the liver. So let me ask you, Nancy, uh, you know, one of the issues when trying to set up uh, positive diagnostic criteria for this disease was to do it in such a way that it sort of overlaps as much as possible with the population that we, we used to be diagnosing using the, the former criteria of NAFLD, because there was a sense of... Um, anxiety that uh, if the population is not overlapping, then many people will, will be left out of the diagnosis and, and the consequence would be that we would have to you know, restudy the disease because it's sort of a different population, which would have very bad consequences for biomarker qualification for clinical trials and, and therapeutic trials and so on. So what feeling do you get from the way it is now framed, the diagnosis? Um, and the publications that followed uh, th this one uh, about the, 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 the possibility that we hit it just right in terms of having sufficient overlap, uh, but while also keeping some homogeneity in the population in relation to metabolic dysfunction. Yeah, I think that it's hard to make a definition that everyone is going to be happy with. And so that was a lot of why it was, was a consensus document and not necessarily a one size fits all right answer. Um, but subsequently, every single large meta analysis or study that has tried to compare the definition of NAFL versus MASLD has shown significant overlap. And most importantly, that you, in the places where one diet definition picked up, the another definition missed, that wasn't a population that was at high risk for disease. And I think whether you like it or not, the group of individuals that is also captured that has alcohol use disorder on top of the metabolic factors often has more progressive disease. And so um, whether you're, you know, we think that the two dis injuries are likely synergistic. So um, you may not have included that population, the NAFL definition, um, but by the MASLD definition or MET-ALD, you're now you're now picking up on a group of, of patients at much more high risk for progression. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, so all in one, you think that this captures a population of people who have who are quite uh, similar in terms of the root cause of the disease, which is uh, metabolic dysfunction, uh, while leaving some odd cases that might not be in the same ideological framework aside uh, so you think that there's progress in in, in that from from what you're you're saying I yes i i do and, and i think that by not labeling something as a, an exclusionary by getting rid of the non-alcohol component you can embrace the dual diagnoses which allows you to address both complications right so it's not good enough to label someone as having NAFLD and ignore their alcohol use it's um so now by calling them met ald or metabolic abnormalities without ald you can you can focus the injury whether it's two injuries or one injury allowing you to risk reduce your patient in front of you so that makes a good transition to the second part of our discussion which is the issue of uh, how to consider alcohol consumption so you have on this slide the the diagnostic flowchart uh, that includes a category that wasn't yet that wasn't present before uh, 
which is this MET ALD category. So we're facing here two problems. The first one is that clearly at higher levels of alcohol consumption above the 2030, probably even above a higher threshold than that, alcohol has a predominant role in liver injury, certainly higher than that of, of metabolic dysfunction or lipotoxicity, if you want to call it that way, associated with insulin resistance. And this has been shown in population-based studies uh, where uh, alcoholic liver disease progresses faster and has a higher rate of uh, 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 bad clinical outcomes. On the other hand, there are also studies in general populations that have shown that metabolic risk factors, and here again is waist circumference, for instance, or diabetes, are have an, um, um, are independent are predictors of of severe liver disease and death, liver related death, independent of alcohol consumption. And more than that. There are some studies, and I'm thinking specifically about a study in Finland, in the in the Finnish pop, Finn risk population, where the two had an additive effect. So, therefore, what are your thoughts about this intermediate category? Do you think it is justified for it to exist, or should it all be under the umbrella of alcoholic liver disease, Nancy? Um. I think it would be unfair to put it all under the umbrella of alcohol-related liver disease. We certainly know that our thin, non-sarcopenic alcoholics tend to do better than our alcohol um, patients who we label as alcohol-related liver disease, who also are obese and have you know, not as effective muscle mass. And so I, I think you have to look at that synergistic or that added effect, allowing you to talk about why it's important to your patient. Um, you know, Before we started this discussion, there was a fair amount of how do you quantify alcohol use, and although the table um, is nice, um, sometimes we don't have that granularity when we talk to the patient in front of us. And so, if you have a person who you feel is metabolically, you know, predominant and minimizes their alcohol use but has progression, um, I often will do a biomarker or try to do something a little more, um, you know, accurate or to try to to delve into concomitant risk factors. We also know that there are a lot of genetic abnormalities, right? So that this table is is great. It's a great start, but it's only the start to the conversation because even with an alcohol use disorder, there are patients that who, who really have minimal risk for liver injury and those that have significant risk even at lower alcohol intake. So it's going to be complicated. Julio, can you tell us about um, any studies that have shown the impact uh, of alcohol in the different complications of type 2 diabetic, diabetic disease? Is that something that in the diabetes research literature it is looked for, the amount of alcohol? We have both uh, sides. That is, there are studies uh, that uh, say that the minimal amount of alcohol may also be preventive of diabetes. But nonetheless, uh, there are a lot of studies uh, suggesting that um, the um, amount uh, of alcohol, the weekly amount of alcohol is intimately linked with uh, lower uh, metabolic compensation and more difficult to compensate a patient who drink alcohol anyway, because uh, uh, the alcohol per se uh, is metabolized and it also um, furnish a considerable amount of calories. So uh, alcohol should be at all avoided in patient with diabetes. And um, yeah, so... this is not uh, the, the case of most patients. And I do believe that uh, alcohol per se may also be uh, a trigger of obesity. Uh, right, so that would be my question to Roberto. How do you, how do you, um, how do you explain to someone the impact that alcohol might have in in um, in aggravating obesity and the calories that are brought by alcohol? Is it something that 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 counts in the in the weight trajectory? Yes, but I, I, I looking at the at the uh, at the slide you presented, uh, I I I have to consider that there are a lot of sh shades of gray. In the in the in the nomen new nomenclature, considering about uh, considering the non alcohol non alcoholic the metabolic the pure metabolic and the pure alcoholic. So uh, 
probably in the in the uh, as ending the overarching uh, uh, definition of the fatty uh, of sorry the steatotic liver but i think that the alcohol intake uh, for sure is an aggravating factor for uh, uh, what i uh, i said uh, uh, just before so uh, it induces and aggravates uh, the situation at the level of uh, not uh, not uh, just at the level of the liver with a straight a very direct effect on the liver but uh, I indirectly by inducing, uh, for example, uh, and aggravating the adiposopathy in uh, in uh, in obese uh, uh, patients. So uh, inducing exactly the same and aggravating aggravating uh, the dysfunction uh, the dysfunctional aspect of adiposopathy at the level of adipose tissue. So with uh, uh, increasing uh, uh, the inflammation, increasing uh, the alteration in the release of uh, cytokines and so on. So. The two phenomena are, uh, are, uh, is, uh, uh, have a synergistic effect on the liver. One is a direct effect, and the other indirectly through the activation of all, of all the alteration already present in obese people and emphasized by the, the alcohol intake. So uh, I think that the two, uh, uh, the two uh, things have to be considered together if uh, we have uh, these uh, uh, new pathophysiologically pathophysiological definition of uh, of uh, uh, of the uh, fatty liver disease of right. so disease. from what you both are saying i understand that there is a very close link uh, not only epidemiological but also pathophysiological pathogenic link between alcohol and and obesity and its consequences and um, turning back to, to you, Nancy, as a practicing hepatologist, so again about this med out category, um, two things. First of all, do you really see in clinical practice patients who are clearly have a metabolic phenotype as a main presenting feature or trait? And then drink alcohol a bit more than the 2030, but obviously not in the dependency or alcohol use disorder range, mostly like a social or hab habitual type of food consumption. So patients where you clearly see they are first metabolic and then with a little bit over consumption of alcohol, do you see them? Do you consider them like more in the NAPL category? And if so, do you think it would be justified to have specific uh, therapeutic trials in that population? Absolutely. So I, I think that the majority, and I think your your location is going to matter, but in America, we see a lot of patients with a metabolic phenotype who drink socially. And if you collectively look at this group, I feel that their risk of liver-related progression is higher than those that have the metabolic phenotype that do not drink. And I also think that they're you know, we have revised our opinion on any kind of benefit from alcohol. I know that Julia suggested that there is literature that that demonstrates that alcohol use might decrease new onset diabetes. And we used to think it had a cardiovascular protection, but now that's kind of been revised. We now think that alcohol is, you know, cancer causing and a relative increase, even if small in most people. And when we look at the patients who have a metabolic phenotype, especially those that don't have advanced fibrosis, they have cardiovascular disease and non-liver related malignancy of which alcohol is going to com contribute to. So I, I think that looking at this population um, differently than those that have a metabolic phenotype that do not drink at all, or or non-metabolic um, phenotype that drink, they should be separated out. These are these are different risk factors. Okay, Lazar, we should also consider that alcohol per se is also uh, driving cancer, and uh, this is uh, definitely a great risk in patients who have uh, MAFLD or any type of MET ALD. So therefore, would any of you in a typically metabolic patient um, suggest or counsel the patient not to drink any amount of alcohol? Or do you think that one or two glasses a day would be would be still be in the safe uh, limit? Well, Short I can take that first. So I think if you have advanced <laughs> liver disease, we counsel no alcohol. 
um, you don't want to add anything to someone who's got stage three, stage four fibrosis. I would also say that one to two glasses of alcohol, especially in a woman, may not be safe. Um, so if you're talking about someone who doesn't have advanced fibrosis with metabolic syndrome, social occasional alcohol is probably not as high risk, um, but you need to recognize that we don't have a safe metric. Yes, I I agree. Okay. If you have already an insult, uh, you uh, you you mm -hmm. have to avoid to uh, add another insult, of course. So zero alcohol for if you have already a diagnosis of uh, of uh, steatotic liver. It would be extremely interesting to demonstrate if alcohol may be the trigger of the very few of the few cases of uh, liver cancer in muffled D in subject without cirrhosis. Okay. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think when we're talking about alcohol and metabolic syndrome, we also have to remind ourselves that bariatric surgery contributes to alcohol risk um, so that, you know, our patients get more and more complicated, the more therapies that they try to, to, to do for their obesity. And maybe GLP-1s will reduce that alcohol-related um, risk factor because they seem to decrease alcohol intake along with all other intake. And FGF-21s as well, maybe. All right. Yes. So... Thank you very much for this discussion. Uh, it was very illuminating, interesting, and also it also shows all the complexity of, of this issue. And I hope you all enjoyed it. And uh, we invite you to tune in next week as we delve into a conversation about a commonly overlooked issue, which is burnout among academics. So uh, remember to become a member, join the Easel family, and have a good week.